My name is uh, Matt McCauley. I'm at the University of Alberta, assistant professor, and uh, I'm very excited to introduce uh, Emily Rodriguez from my lab. So Emily uh, received a Bachelor of Science at Western University, that's in Ontario, uh, in 2015, uh, followed uh, by a master's at Western uh, under the supervision of uh, Len Lute, uh, developing expertise in peptide chemistry. Um, but I think there she got a, a, an itch for uh, chemical biology. So Emily's now a, a fourth year PhD student in my lab. Um, she hold, has received numerous um, fellowships and right now she holds a, a major graduate fellowship from Alberta Innovates, um, has also received numerous sort of best poster awards at local, national and international symposia. Um, and uh, in addition to being a, a fantastic scientist, uh, Emily gives back to science in a myriad uh, of ways that, that I want to tell you about. One is that uh, she serves as the executive committee chair of the Glyconet Graduate Training Association. Um, and she also regularly participates in Skype a Scientist and Let's Talk Scientist Science, uh, which are programs that offer young kids and teenagers the opportunity to talk to a real life scientist. So without further ado, I will let I will uh, let Emily tell you about some of the ongoing work she's involved in. Thank you, Matt, for, for the introduction. And thank you to Glyconet uh, for giving me the opportunity to speak about my work, which is leveraging avidity to increase the detection of siglec ligands using uh, our new versatile uh, soluble siglec scaffold. Um, so uh, the Macaulay Lab in general, my project is interested in a family of membrane bound proteins that are found on immune cells called the silic acid binding immunoglobulin type lectins, or just SIGLEX for short. So in humans, there are 15 different SIGLEX that when they bind to their ligand, which is a silic acid containing glycoconjugate, uh, this can inhibit immune cell uh, functions. And this happens uh, when a SIGLEX interacts with silic acid, this can create a spatial change of where the SIGLEX is located on the immune cell and this allows for the immunoreceptor tyrosine-based inhibition motif or ITIM on the, on the cytosolic region to get phosphorylated that we can recruit phosphatases such as SHP1. Uh, and then this can then downstream dampen cellular signaling, uh, which can inhibit uh, immune cell activation or function. So this interaction is really important in maintaining a healthy homeostasis uh, throughout an, our entire body, but this can be exploited in many different disease states. And one of the most prominent examples of when this happens uh, and is used against us is in cancer. And this is because cancer has been well known to up, be able to upregulate the amount of silic acid on its cell surface. And through this uh, and the interaction with different SIGLEX can inhibit the killing of the cancer cells, for example, through SIGLEX-7 or SIGLEX-9, or it can skew the inflammatory response in order to favor that of the cancer cells, for example, through SIGLEX-3 or SIGLEX-9 as well. So to be able to um, inhibit this misregulation, researchers uh, have devised ways to remove the silic acid on the cell surface of these uh, disease cells. Uh, either through the uh, feeding of 3 fluoronu 5 ac uh, which is a global cell transferase inhibitor that won't allow silic acid to be added onto the cell surface, through the use of anti-siglec antibodies to block the interaction of a siglec and its ligand, or through something, for example, like a anti-HER2 neuraminidase conjugate, uh, which can um, specifically cleave off silic acid on uh, HER2-expressing cancer cells. However, this uh, approach, these approaches all remain quite blunt as it removes all the silic acid on the cell surface. And due to silic acid being so important in maintaining a healthy homeostasis, it'd be beneficial if we could create a more targeted approach in order to be able to just disrupt the, a certain siglec silic acid interaction. But to be able to do so, we need to be, have a better understanding of what the ligands, specific ligands, um, of these siglecs are and where they are expressed on certain cells. However, their uh, siglecs are quite difficult to study because they are cell membrane bound proteins and they typically have a very low affinity for their ligands, which are typically in the millimolar range. So to get around these hurdles, uh, typically what researchers have done is to use these um, siglec FC chimeras which are composed of an immunoglobulin FC domain that is directly linked to two to five 
extracellular domains of a SIGLEC. So this allows for dimerization of a SIGLEC that increases the avidity to a bivalent uh, presentation, as well as allows for um, detection using anti-human IgG1 uh, antibodies. However, these do have a lot of drawbacks because um, they are still only bivalent. So the, uh, the you know, affinity or avidity to their ligands still is quite uh, low, uh, as well as it only allows for one method of detection. So uh, our, you know, I started up this project when I joined Matt's lab, uh, and we previously, uh, we just published this paper in the fall of showing this new FC Chimeric library that has four different features that the standard SIGLEC FC constructs don't have. Uh, and they involve uh, like a TV site in between a SIGLEC, uh, the, the SIGLEC and the FC region to create monomeric SIGLECs that can be used in different biochemical assays, such as uh, my spectrometry that we've shown in collaboration with Dr. John Klassen's group at the University of Alberta as well as we have made uh, FC receptor avoiding mutations in the FC region so we can more sensitively detect uh, SIGLEC ligands on the surface of immune cells without any nonspecific interactions. But more uh, importantly, what I'm, gonna, like, uh, what I'm gonna hit on today is the addition of the strip tag two. And this allows for another method of purification, but more importantly, it allows for uh, a way that we can multimerize these bivalent uh, SIGLEC FCs. And this is because we want to look at uh, the SIGLEC binding on cell surfaces, which is traditionally done in a two-step assay, where you take your cells and you incubate the SIGLEC FCs on them, you, give a, uh, you wash the cells, and then you add in your secondary. However, again, these are only bivalent molecules, so uh, the affinity to the ligands still be quite, could be quite uh, low. Um, and this would then be washing off some of the SIGLEC uh, binding, you know, giving an artificially low signal, even if there are uh, ligands on the cell surface. So the addition of the strep tag two allows us to do a pre-complexing assay with streptactin, which is a triple mutant of streptavidin that has a high affinity to the strep tag two. Uh, and this now creates, instead of a bivalent presentation into an octameric presentation. And then we can add this complex directly to cells and we have increased the avidity that will withstand multiple washes on the cell surface and uh, still uh, show the fluorescently labeled cells. So we've done this with a, a wide variety of different cell lines that we have in the lab, as well as breast cancer cell lines. Uh, but what we really wanted to look at was the SIGLEC ligands on uh, human peripheral white blood cells. And so we've done this, we've screened it by flow cytometry. And so this is the entire SIGLEC FC library that we've created in the wild type FC version, um, as well as in their essential arginine mutant that is no longer able to bind to silic acid. So this is our control for any non-specific binding. And so what we can see here uh, is, you know, binding that we expected. Uh, CD22 is known to have ligands across all immune subtypes uh, with lower binding on neutrophils. Um, as well as SIGLEX 6 and 7 showing binding across the board, which is uh, across all subtypes, which is expected. Uh, and then we can not only uh, use these SIGLEX octameric structures uh, in a flow cytometry assay, we can also look at them by immunofluorescence. So these are actually human uh, spleen slices that we've stained with our SIGLEX 7 uh, wild type uh, octameric um, uh, octameric complexes. And what we can see here is uh, a wide staining of SIGLEC7 across all the white blood cells found in a human spleen, which matches very nicely of what we're seeing in the flow-based uh, assay. And this is silic acid dependent because we are not seeing any staining of the SIGLEC uh, mutant or the SIGLEC arginine mutant, uh, as well as when we treat these spleen slices with nerminidase A, which cleaves all silic acid on the cell surface the wild type is no longer binding. So these are screening uh, healthy human samples with uh, the SIGLEC uh, library, but we wanna see how it changes in certain disease states. So in collaboration with Dr. Bruce Ritchie at the University of Alberta, we've been able to get uh, some SARS-CoV-2 positive uh, patient blood samples. 
So here uh, in this example, I have three healthy patients, the ones in black, as well as three uh, patients that were diagnosed with COVID. Um, they uh, have a 40 to 60 year age range and they were never hospitalized. And so we have longitudinal samples of multiple different patients, either uh, patients that were tested positive that uh, weren't hospitalized or ones that were in the ICU to see how the ligands change. Uh, just for example here, I wanted to, to show as this is ongoing work um, that certain SIGLEX are either increased, have increased ligand expression or decreased. So I'm not mentioning exactly what SIGLEX here is, we're currently still looking into it. Um, but you can see on the granulocytes, on the eosinophils and the neutrophils, you are getting uh, an increased presence of SIGLEX ligand on day one and on day seven. However, that neutrophil increase on day one does drop down to the healthy levels that we're seeing. Um, and on the T cell compartment, we're actually seeing a decrease of SIGLEC ligands occurring on day one and, day, and on day seven. So this is again, ongoing work. And so we're looking further into this, um, uh, you know, looking further into this and how this could be implicated for different disease states. However, um, going forward from this, we wanted to increase our sensitivity to see, um, you know, more or different SIGLEC ligands on cell types that we previously might not have been able to identify, as well as we want a more biocompatible version. As this tetramer uh, is only, uh, it's a, you know, it's, it's a non-covalent link, so it can't be used uh, in applications such as in vivo. So we wanted to increase this avidity past an octameric presentation. So we did this by uh, creating a new SIGLEC FC version, which is uh, has the same four uh, as same four additives as the previous version, except it now has a formal glycine generating enzyme consensus sequence next to the TEV site, and this will allow us to use that TEV site to cleave off the FC region to create this monomeric SIGLEC. Uh, portion, and then also have the FGE consensus sequence uh, to be shown. And so that allows for FGE to come in and site specifically modify the cysteine into an aldehyde that can then be reacted with an amino oxy uh, labeled molecule of your choice. And so this can be shown that it can work uh, by using an amino oxy uh, label, uh, amino oxy biotin. So this is just a Western blot of CD22 or SIGLEC2 showing that only when FGE and amino oxy biotin is added onto the CD22, uh, we can get uh, binding of streptavidin HRP. But more importantly, what we really wanted to use this for was to be uh, able to react the SIGLEX with an amino oxy peg DSPE lipid. So again, this is CD22 just showing before and after reaction of the DSPE lipid. You can see a slight increase around 3,000 uh, 3, Daltons showing that the uh, lipid has been added to the SIGLEC. And so this lipid will allow us, uh, allows us to be, to create a SIGLEC liposomal nanoparticle that has a fluorophore in it. And uh, we can use this in any cell-based or in vivo assay um, and we have increased this avidity now from an octamer, so eight copies, up to around eight, uh, 80 copies of the SIGLEC, so severely increased uh, that avidity. And we can see that increasing this avidity increases the signal uh, of SIGLEC1 in, uh, in this example. So you can see that uh, going from a tetrameric presentation of SIGLEC1 all the way up to uh, a multimeric on the SIGLEC liposomes, where you're getting a significant increase of SIGLEC1 binding to cells, uh, and the arginine mutant is not also increasing, uh, which is indicating that this is purely silic acid dependent on the presentation of the multimerization of the SIGLEX. So this increase um, is, you know, really important, but SIGLEC1 already binds very well as, you know, as an octamer. So this is really more uh, beneficial for SIGLEX that we are not seeing very good staining using our tetrameric, or sorry, an octameric presentation uh, in cell-based assay. And one of those SIGLEX is SIGLEC10. So SIGLEC10, uh, you know, if you, if I panel three of uh, the breast cancer cell lines we have, does not really bind well. Uh, so you would think that there might not be SIGLEC10 uh, SIGLEC ligands on it. But if I panel those three same 
uh, cell lines with our SIGLEC-10 uh, liposomes, we are now actually getting binding, so the presence of SIGLEC-10 ligands on BT549 uh, cells. So this is really interesting. We're getting better sensitivity of these ligands, as well as we are uh, able to investigate other cell lines and look at the different linkages that SIGLEC-10 uh, might prefer. So again, if we go to a U937 uh, cell line and panel it with a, uh, our uh, octameric presentation compared to our liposome, we are getting a uh, significant increase in binding with the SIGLEC-10 liposomes. And then we can look at different uh, cell types uh, of the U937s. So we have SD6-GAL1 knocked out U937s. This does not have any more 2,6-linked silic acid on the cell surface. And we are seeing a uh, statistically significant decrease in binding of SIGLEC-10, uh, but it is not down to baseline, indicating that it is binding to 2,3, uh, there are 2,6-linked silic acid, as well as other linkages that are still present on the cell surface. And so these liposomes, which is really important, is that they're also biocompatible. So we can actually, um, we can look at the same interaction of, you know, 2,3 and 2,6 two, six preferences of SIGLEC-10 in mouse models, because we can inject these SIGLEC liposomes um, into either a wild-type mouse or an SD6-GAL1 flux flux mb one Cree mouse model. And so this mouse model has SD6-GAL1 knocked out specifically in just the B cells. And so we can see the same trend that we're seeing in U937 cells um, in these uh, mouse models. So when we take the spleens out of the mice and then look at the white blood cells uh, or the, the, the immune cells from the, the spleens, we can see a statistically significant decrease in SIGLEC-10 binding occurring in the B cells of the SD6-GAL1 flux flux mice, but we see no decrease in binding in the T cells as they still have 2,6-linked silic acid on their surface. So this is really uh, exciting to be able to have this uh, SIGLEC platform that we can be uh, look at SIGLEC ligands in vivo. And lastly, I just want to quickly touch on some preliminary glycan microarray data that we have. Uh, we've been working in collaboration with Dr. Vered Padler Caravani at Tel Aviv University, uh, and this is because uh, you know SIGLECs have been uh, quite uh, challenging to be used on glycan microarrays. But we've been we've provided her with the entire SIGLEC uh, library as well as the Arginine Mutant. And I'm highlighting here just SIGLEC-5. So we're seeing binding of SIGLEC-5 to a wide variety of different linkages, um, as well as to, uh, and we're not seeing any binding of the arginine mutant, which is uh, what we are expecting. As well as I want to just highlight here glycan-41, which is GD3, uh, as we're seeing its binding in the glycan microarray. And this backs up uh, you know, cell assay data that we have in our lab of SIGLEC-5 binding to GD3 uh, liposomes. Also, we uh, have been working in collaboration with Dr. Laura Mahal's lab at the University of Alberta. And so this is putting our SIGLEC FCs on their uh, glycan chips. And we can see uh, in the case here of SIGLEC-7, we're getting an increase of SIGLEC-7 binding when uh, we flow over or when we put SD6-GAL1 over expressing U937 cell lysates as well as we can see CD22 binding uh, when fetuin uh, is added to these uh, microarrays. So in conclusion, we've been able to create these new SIGLEC FC constructs that have multiple additions to them that upgrade them from our from traditional SIGLEC FC uh, chimeras. So they can be used uh, just like these in like in microarrays or mass uh, spec assays, or we can increase into an octamer uh, using the strep tag or with the addition of the FGE. Now we can make a more biocompatible platform to be able to investigate SIGLEC ligands uh, in vivo with greater avidity. So overall, we're getting closer to understanding the ligands of these SIGLECs uh, in their natural environment that will allow us to create a more targeted approach to blocking these SIGLEC ligand interactions in different disease states. So I just want to uh, quickly thank the uh, funding sources, uh, our fi my funding sources, Glyconet and Alberta Innovates for directly funding me, as well as NSERC for funding the lab. Uh, the fantastic collaborators that I've been very fortunate to, to be able to work with, uh, as well as my PI, uh, Matt, for all of his help, and the entire Macaulay Lab, uh, past and present, uh, for everything. And I would love to uh, answer any questions.